Welcome to Man Cove Wellbeing and the My Trauma, Your Trauma series with me, Owen Morgan. I want to share my trauma journey and that of others. We will also look at the world of trauma healing, support and research, including guests who specialize in helping those overcome their trauma. My Trauma, Your Trauma is here to explore human experience. Welcome to Trauma Chat, where we invite on a guest or guest in this case to talk all things trauma. Please watch and listen with care. Some of this content may be triggering or may make you feel uncomfortable. So do press that stop button and take a break. Always put yourself first. I'm a mental health advocate. I've interviewed hundreds of wellness experts and also spent time with people who have stories of overcoming their wellness struggles. I myself have suffered from childhood abuse from childminders, severe school bullying, a deep depression in my 20s, and blackout anxiety, plus a life-threatening illness in my early 30s. I want to give a voice to those who can inspire others to improve wellness. Right, I am so excited for the finale of season two. Thank you for everybody that follows the My Trauma, Your Trauma podcast. Uh, I've always been a massive lover of polyvagal theory, and that's what we're going to be covering today. And both of my guests, who I now consider really great friends of mine, um, are very into polyvagal too. So we're going to have a complete nerd off today, geek off, whatever you want to call it, about polyvagal. Uh, we're just just to mention, we haven't got like you know lifelong diplomas in polyvagal or anything like that. We just love it. It does inform how we work with our clients, and it's changed our lives, I think, on some level. So we're going to have a proper deep dive into this, especially as uh, as guys too talking about it. So on today's show, we welcome back many a time, John Eli, who's a virtual mindset coach based in Arizona in America. John helps men learn how to manage their lives during turbulent times. He's also part of our My Trauma, Your Trauma magazine show. And we've also had a one-to-one -one about his coaching. So go over to YouTube, check it out. We also welcome on Dave Furness, who is a trauma-informed coach and mental health advocate. He hosts the Let's Talk Mental Health podcast and has a passion to make vulnerability mainstream. He works with his clients to help them heal mentally uh, and emotionally from trauma, rewire their nervous system response, and working with subconscious beliefs and coping strategies. He offers one-to-one -one coaching and group coaching. Whoa, welcome to the show, guys. How are we today, John? How are you doing, mate? Doing absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Owen. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, as always, for all of your unbelievable support on Instagram. And that can be said for my brand new friend, Dave. How are we today, my friend? I'm uh, I'm doing well, mate. A little bit warm, but we're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, not not hope, coping too well with this uh, this heat wave but, uh, that we're currently experiencing. But I, uh, I'm not complaining. Not compl I'm embracing it. <laughs> I'm embracing it. Yes, quite off camera. We uh, also, you know, we told John about how hard we're finding it with our 30 degrees. And, and then he got <laughs> to tell us about his 42 degrees. And we felt very yeah, still. We lost that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how does, so for, for you, John, how does it feel to hear some Brits complaining like that? I just, I, I have to laugh a little bit because, yeah, I, I feel like I live in Satan's armpit sometimes. It's it's not fun and it's only going to get hotter. Summer's just begun. I know. We certainly get um, used to kind of certain ways of um, being, don't we, in our various environments. But, you know, on, on a more serious note, they do say that heat isn't good for COVID-19 when we're filming this. So, Maybe, you know, that's going to help. Maybe this heat could be really useful for that. So let's hope that's the case. That'd be amazing if, if so. So that's great. Yeah, because we're about 14 weeks in or so in the UK with COVID. So I think we're all starting to get a bit back to normal in the UK. How is it oh, in the US at the moment? I know you've got all of the problems, of course, with the Black Lives Movement and, and Trump being, should we say, interesting. Um, so how, how is the COVID situation over there, mate? I haven't checked recently. So in other parts of the nation, there seems to be a decline. However, I am living right in the middle of the hot spot. So it, they, the government opened, reopened early. So there's a lot of people that have not been taking uh, COVID as seriously uh, in the city that I live in, the, the metropolitan area. And so we're seeing numbers rise by the thousands. The hospitals are filled right now. I have a lot of friends that work in the health industry and uh, they, they're just really uh, at a loss, not having enough staff to take care of everybody. So it's still scary in my neck of the woods where I currently live. And I am happily sheltered in my home. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. It sounds like you guys are kind of 
you know, I don't know, maybe seven or eight weeks behind us, I guess, because we had that period of time too. It seems to be getting a lot better. But if you look at the beach, the pictures of the beaches this weekend, Dave, did you see that? The pictures of Bournemouth? I was just, I was just going to say, mate. I mean, I, you know, I've got, uh, I've got business partners out in Florida, and they were saying the same thing, John. They're seeing another spike at the minute, and I remember like they when they were opening up daytona beach and stuff out there and i was like wow already like it seems pretty soon and you know we know that coronavirus seems to have like a almost like a two-week delay like you know you open back up and then two weeks later you see the effects and i do you know i i worry oh and you know we've seen a lot of mass gatherings happening in the uk recently and you know not getting into the reasons why you know i totally understand a lot of the reasons behind it but still and again, seeing the beaches, especially yesterday uh, when we're recording this, we had another 30 degree day. Beaches are packed. There's literally no social distancing. And like I said, yeah, heat and UV light is apparently a good thing to try and kill the virus. But I don't know. I just hope that we don't see a, another wave, another spike come from the, you know, the actions of, of a few people, um, you know, ignoring the social distancing stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's quite complicated, isn't it? You know, we're not going to go into it today, but, you know, mentally and emotionally, everybody's struggling. It's been such a long time over here and people are just getting really itchy. I get it. It's really tough for a lot of people mentally. So it's 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 a strange old world. And hey, 2020 has been, you know, let's be honest, pretty tough with everything, you know, with black lives. And, and there's been a lot of, you know, sort of stabbing terrorist stuff here in the uk and it's like, oh god can this year can it please just start to <laughs> come back to normal but that's the whole point of why we're here today and why we're going to talk about this because these experiences with covid are going to have a massive effect from a polyvagal perspective too so it seems really relevant right now for us free to have this conversation actually because we can talk about polyvagal generally as a general thing you know across our lifetimes but specifically this year um, we're going to be seeing a big decline in a lot of our nervous systems and how we can try and get back online, should we say. So uh, before we get going, do you, can each of you just let the audience know just briefly what you, you're kind of doing, especially within kind of the male sector and stuff. So if we go back over to you, John, um, just a little overview of, of what you're up to with your business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I am a virtual mindset coach and I work specifically with men. Uh, and what I do is I help empower men. I teach men how to manage their lives, how to navigate their lives through uh, turbulent times. Uh, many times uh, men experience different events in, in their lifetime, uh, be it whether it's a choice that they personally made or a choice that someone else made, and they allow that choice to become their identity. And what I do is I empower men to re-encounter their authentic self and to envision a life and create a plan to to live life outside of their current circumstance i love what i do i love empowering people amazing absolutely love it so dave how about you your work and your podcast worth giving that a mention too oh thank you sir um yeah well i'm a, I, i'm a trauma-informed coach um i help people identify and work through the things which are keeping them stuck um largely a lot of behaviors like procrastination perfectionism or just things like again signs of depression anxiety um they all stem from uh, a trauma usually somewhere in their life doesn't have to be a big trauma doesn't have to be anything that you you know a lot of people don't even recognize it as trauma but it can be abandonment as a child and, and not feeling worthy and these things can snowball and uh get bigger into adulthood and and really impact the story that we tell ourselves so my job is to try and help people you know reframe that story like tell themselves a different story get to you know some of those core beliefs and help people reconnect with a with a purpose and yeah get, fall back in love with life and you know a, a polyvagal is a huge part of what i do with that um you know i often find people getting stuck in dorsal or sympathetic or spending far too much time in those states and not being able to get back to ventral um you know there's elements of attachment theory in there as well um so yeah and then obviously i it all started with the podcast the let's talk mental health podcast because i noticed that men were terrible at talking about how they were feeling and what they were going through and what they had been through and um yeah, the, the Let's Talk Mental Health podcast started off as me in a car with someone else having a casual chat and uh, creating safety in order for that vulnerable, vulnerable conversation to happen. And obviously COVID has meant it had to go onto Zoom and there's, I don't have to drive around anymore. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, and it, it all stems from men, me wanting to connect with men and 
uh, trying to encourage the vulnerable conversations. And because I truly believe that that's where where the healing begins, like when we bring an awareness to it. Um, you know, I, I've said this before. It, it's like fighting a fire with a blindfold on. It's like you might have the holes, but you don't know where to point it. And when you bring an awareness, especially to things like polyvagal, it's like ripping the blindfold off and you can go, ah, there's the problem. Let's let's deal with that. So that's a bit of an insight into what I do, I guess. Yeah, thank you, my friends. And you know, for anybody listening, I've done one to ones. By the time this comes out, Dave's my one our one to one will be out. So there's there's videos for both for both John and Dave and our one to ones. You find out a lot more about us over a good hour of chatting. So go and check that out. I will, if I can remember, put the links in when I edit this. I might forget by then, but I will try and remember. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys. I'm really, really excited for this. So just to reiterate, we're talking about but essentially, we're talking about polyvagal theory, why we love it, what we have learned about it, and the general impacts of trauma on our nervous system. So we will touch a little bit on that too. Uh, like I said, we don't have like crazy degrees and diplomas in this. We just love it. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I, I look online, and it's interesting because when I look at polyvagal theory, generally to get an overview, it's quite hard to find a very brief, you know, little snippet of it because there's a lot to it. So I found this though. So I'm going to read this out and then we'll and then we'll get into it. So I've got to try and say some of these words, so I do apologize if I get them wrong. <laughs> so the polyvagal theory is a collection of evolutionary, uh, neuroscientific and physiological claims focusing on the vagus nerve as playing a central role in emotional regulation, social connection and fear response. The polyvagal theory provided us with a sophisticated understanding of the biology of safety and danger, one based on the subtle interplay between visceral experiences of our own bodies and the voices and faces of people around us. It is suggested we have a certain state, we have certain states within the nervous system, safe and social, fight and flight, and shut down. This impacts our behaviors, thoughts, and general health. I got every word right, so exciting. Um, so that is one hell of a paragraph. Um, I actually get all of it, which shows how much I know about polyvagal. I'm sure you guys are the same. So I'm excited that I understand all of that. That's a good start. But I know for a lot of people listening and just getting into this, maybe I'm sure. And that's the whole point of this today, guys. We've got at least 45 minutes left to, to break this all down. So just in brief, before we talk about the impact that polyvagal can have on us, back over to you, John. Why do you love polyvagal so much? <laughs> Why do I love it so much? I absolutely love it. You know, prior uh, to my discovery of polyvagal theory, I just simply didn't have the vocabulary to explain what I was experiencing. Uh, part of my life journey is that I experienced uh, trauma in childhood and I had been through cognitive behavioral uh, therapy. I had uh, this way of understanding what was going on inside of my head, but there was something going on inside of my body that wasn't in alignment. It didn't matter how many times I tried to replace my thoughts. Uh, I knew that there was something going on with me. So uh, polyvagal theory actually gave me an understanding of what was taking place within me on a, on a physiological level, and it brought some, some normality. It made me understand why my heart was racing, why sometimes whenever I was stressed out, my arms would jerk by themselves, or why sometimes uh, I would just freeze up when I felt fear or overwhelm. Um, it, it just really helped me understand that uh, I wasn't a weird you know, case out there out of nowhere but that my body was doing what it was created to do. Wow, yeah, so powerful. Um, and for, for you, Dave, I'm excited to see where it came from, your love. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, it's a very similar story to John's, to be honest. Um, you know, me going through my own battles with depression and, and moments of anxiety. Um, after, you know, again, I went to sort of a counsellor therapist and, and started doing the work as, as I call it, you know, you, you, you start doing the hard stuff and start, you know, asking the hard questions. I started getting more and more curious because in the midst of my sort of depression, the way that it was being framed in my mind was, you know, what's wrong with me? I'm broken. My brain's become my worst enemy and I don't, I can't live like this anymore. And polyvagal for me sort of reframed that. And it was instead of being like, there's something wrong, it became your nervous system's trying to keep you safe. And that in itself was a huge switch for me. And I was like, wow, OK, so why is it doing this? Because like I said, sometimes the nervous system is hypervigilant. You know, it does these things to protect us, which can lead to undesirable lifestyle outcomes. 
So when you become aware of that, it, it for me it was just like, boom, okay, now it makes now it makes sense. My brain's not the bad guy; it's actually trying to protect me. Well, let's look at. And for me, it was a case of like, well, I've not always had it, so I can, you know, I can unlearn, you know, whatever's put me in this state. I can climb the ladder back out, so to speak. So that was that's why I fell in love with it. It it, it made a lot of sense to me and reframed a lot of the negativity around for me depression mental health stuff like that and, and change the focus from there's something wrong to what happened you know i think that was a huge shift for me yeah thank you guys and i totally echo that the language bit you know i was looking for my language my language to explain my experience and i took bits from all the different modalities that i'd had over the years and stuff that i'd learned and that was great and that's, that's awesome even the meditation and mindfulness stuff really helped but i really wanted to get a sense of the understanding of what was going on in my body and i just couldn't quite figure out the right words to use until this came along and understand that we're always going to be in some form of state at any given time and i just want to say straight off the bat for anybody listening some people go, well, it's not all body. And yes, that's true. Of course it is. There's top, you know, it's bottom up and top down. We're not saying that top down doesn't exist. Of course, you know, ha things that happen with our mind and our thoughts will have an effect on our nervous system state. Of course it will. But from what I've read with, you know, Basil Van Kolk's work too, that it's, isn't it something like 80% bottom up to... Yeah, there's, a, there's a, you know, I think he calls it 80% uh, afferent fibers, body to brain and 20% afferent brain to body. So... Yeah, yeah so it's all linked and, and when you look at like the vagus nerve the 10th cranial nerve it comes to the face but then pretty much the rest of it goes all through the body right down to the diaphragm um so yeah it's there's a lot of body involved we are talking about when we talk about the body anyway like you say it includes the face massively includes the face and also at the end of the day your brain is part of your nervous system it's not like they're too, we're not saying this there's this lower nervous system and a, a gate manager or something say hey uh, you're not allowed into the brain quite yet. <laughs> the, the brain is part of polyvagal theory. I just wanted to say that straight off the bat so no one's getting confused here if they're hearing about it for the first time. So it is a, a, a whole body holistic state, I guess you could say. Um, uh, it's more complicated than that, obviously, but we'll, we'll break that down. And for, like I said, same for you guys, language. It empowered me too. I have to say a lot of the people I've told about this, especially my massage clients, messaged it to them. They found it really empowering to know that, you could, that to be a compassionate observer of your experience, polyvagal allows you to do that because you can question and go, what state am I in today? Or, oh, that's interesting. I got triggered by that. It gives you all this empowerment to realize that you are not your behaviors. And when people say, oh, that person over there is just a nightmare. They're so rude all the time and they're horrible. I think, hang on a minute, that person's just got a dysregulated nervous system right now. And I can detach from that and show the human being compassion rather than the whole of them. Compassion for the human being, their nervous system struggling. What can I do to help their nervous system? Um, and that seems much more um, easy to deal with than why are they being horrible to me? It must be something to do with me or you can, separate that can't you which is a great thing i think yeah i think that's such a, a huge thing like when i guess polyvagal for me has sort of highlighted that people very rarely act randomly you know there's usually a reason for the behavior and when you bring a sort of a polyvagal trauma-informed approach you can look for the why like what happened like what 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 caused a dysregulation for this behavior to show itself and that's a very key thing when we're looking like i said the awareness is i think that's probably one of the, the main things about polyvagal it brings an awareness to what is going on yeah definitely and um i'll come up to you john in a second because it's always weird when it's three of us i'm so used to one to one um but me and my me and my partner always think we're trying to think of, like the ultimate blend of like support you can get so we thought if you've got mindfulness polyvagal somatic experiencing and like some form of psychotherapy it's party time. You know, that's your dream, your dream team of of support services, I think. It's just just awesome combo. But anyway, that's enough of me geeking out on the ultimate uh, ultimate box set of support. <laughs> so we're looking at how did polyvagal theory impact your life and work? Well, I think we kind of covered that, haven't we? Let's be honest. Uh, do you guys have any other points on how it's impacted you personally? So for you, John, did it help? Once you learned about it, were you able to implement it for change for yourself? Yeah, so there, there's something really huge the way that it it, it transformed my life because uh, I was really influenced by by cultural and religious norms, 
And both, uh, I'm a Latino, uh, I'm third generation Mexican American in the United States. And so, uh, uh, having both that and having this religious upbringing, I was basically taught that a- expressing any emotion outside of joy was, was wrong. And so I always judged myself. And whenever what well, polyvagal theory uh, allowed me to realize is that, uh, it's a biological response to external stimuli. Uh, and it helped me realize that whenever my mind sometimes fails me, my body is there to protect me, to jump in, to bring me awareness of uh, danger, uh, even um, whenever I'm clueless. And, and I love that because as a person who experienced trauma in life, uh, people failed me. People who were supposed to protect me and be there for me, uh, just they weren't for whatever reason. But this, knowing this, just made me feel so empowered that my body kicks in whenever other people might not. And so it just, it made me feel, it made me feel safe and secure (laughs) just knowing that. And this is a message that I also uh, communicate with clients uh, in in teaching them how to connect with themselves, letting go of self-judgment, of uh, cultural and societal judgments that, uh, that usually they, they have to deal with uh, because uh, we're always coming from a place of assessing and trying to make meaning of things. And polyvagal theory just kind of allows us to release those those preconceived notions. That's a really nice way to look at it, how, yeah, you feel safe because your body is a protector. I mean, our bodies are made to protect us. There, what, there'd be no point of fight and flight if it, that wasn't a protective mechanism to run away from the saber-toothed tiger, which is always the classic uh, animal of choice. Don't know why. Um, but, you know, that's the amazing thing about the body, isn't it? It's always here ha- trying to help you out. It even tries to battle illnesses. You get an illness, it battles it off. You know, it's amazing that we're so blessed to have these bodies. We forget that sometimes. So for you, Dave, did you were you able to apply kind of what you learned about it to anything that you were going through absolutely Uh, you know i i attribute um polyvagal to a large part of my recovery along with a lot of the you know the the, you know the practices that we've spoken about before sort of mindfulness and and meditation yoga you know these activities which again i'm a big again like 80 percent body 20 percent brain right mindfulness is great but if the body's not on board it's going to have a very limited effect so for me doing the things like the yoga um you know having a good diet you know the gut health you know connection to the mind as well it's it's all connected and that's why you know i know john you just mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy like that is very mind orientated and for someone who isn't who hasn't got the body on board isn't into the somatics, it's going to have a very limiting impact. It's not going to fully get to the bottom of it. So like we said, like you said at the beginning, Owen, like the top down, bottom up, you know, mentality is like, yeah, we need both. But really, we need the body on board before anything prefrontal cortex is really going to stick, is really going to impact. Um, So yeah, I I mean, polyvagal was a huge thing for me. Um, Like I said, I think bringing that awareness to what was actually going on in the body, Um, Again, if we look at polyvagal as the science of safety and connection, um, that just, again, having that awareness that the body is trying to protect you um, and it's all connected, like I said. And, you know, I think that's a big thing for me is, you know, people think mental health is all in the head. It's like, no, we need to change that. Like mental health is emotional health and emotional health is nervous system and and everything. Um, So, yeah, that, that, that was probably the key takeaways for me. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, like like for me, the main shift and change was very much being able to understand what was going on for me. And we will talk. I'm, I'm looking at my questions going, have I not put triggers and glimmers in, which is controversial. So I def- <laughs> triggers and glimmers. I'm definitely bringing that in. Love that's that. Deb Dana's words. Deb Dana's amazing. So if anybody that doesn't know already, Stephen Porges is the legendary guy that created got a book right here. the whole theory dave's got it he's always got it right next to his computer good, good call i do it's like they're like my bible's got the yeah, yeah, yeah. Polyvagal theory. so he, the he did that and a dead dana took all of the theory and then applied it to help people who work with clients to apply it with techniques and and all this kind of stuff but her stuff's amazing too she just released a new book about self-regulation tools and it's blowing my mind i've been listening to it the last few weeks it's so good so deb dana seem porges they they're your main lot i only check bezel van der kolk in just because he's so body-based and he's mentioned quite a few times 
in the polyvagal books and likewise the other way around. So they feel like they're, they're good mates. They hang out with coffee and <laughs> like we do and have a good time. So that's really, really cool. <laughs> but I will bring triggers and glimmers in because what, what it allowed me to do was to see my triggers and glimmers, the things that change my states and being aware of, whoa, okay, that just triggered me. I've gone straight into fight and flight. I wonder what that's about. And then being able to reflect on that and start to see pathways and you know, where these things are coming from. And it really empowered me to see what I could work on. Okay, this environment triggers me. Maybe I can work on that. I kind of heal that over time. And I look at my next trigger or things that make me super safe and social and just make me feel absolutely immense and making sure that I integrate that into my life and really understand why I feel safe and social doing that and what other things can I do. Um, like we know, we, we talk about later, you know, you talk all about the vagus nerve stuff, don't they? Like cold showers and... Um, it's kind of like chanting is like chant humming. There's certain vibrations that yep. help your nervous system. The frequencies. So we'll talk about that later. So you can bring all of that in. So these questions can be a bit weird because we're actually, this is for people that may not know anything about it. So we're going to talk about the basics, but I know the three of us are probably going to say the similar things, but we're going to do, go for it anyway. So we'll talk about our thoughts on the polyvagal state. So if we go to you, John, and if you just want, if you can let people know in your own words, the different states and what may or may not kind of bring those states about, I guess would be a good way to look at it. Yeah, so I, I have to be honest with you. I have I struggle so much to remember uh, the, the way that they're labeled, you know, ventral vagal, sympathetic, and dorsal. It was really, I really struggled to, to grasp those, even though I could view them on the, on the ladder. Uh, so I, I had downloaded a worksheet from, from Deb Dana, and it gave like, a way for you to place them in your own words. So uh, the way that I navigate through them is I, I label them free, frantic, tra or trapped, or frozen. Uh, because whenever I am feeling ventral vagal, I feel free. That's like where I am able to be me, my authentic self. I'm feeling connected with others, but most of all connected with who I am as a person. Uh, and frantic, that's exactly the way I am whenever I'm at a sympathetic uh, state, uh, flight or, or fight. Uh, I literally will sense my arms moving on their own. I never understood why my arms would jerk the way that they do. But it's my body's response saying, let's get out of here or let's defend yourself. Um, and then frozen, whenever I feel like I'm absolutely defeated, whenever I feel like there's no hope uh and I am just feeling trapped and impending death. There's some days I feel that way. Uh, but that's the way that, that I have personally labeled them to be able to move from one state to another. And I want to live free. Oh, I love the way you've used your own, you know, language within the language. That's really cool. I love people that kind of make it the story fit. It's, it's just a good way to learn, isn't it? When you're learning courses and stuff too, which is amazing. And um, oh, I had a really good point, but it's gone. So I go straight to you, Dave. I'm sure it'll come back to me. So, um, yeah, so we're just talking about the different states in your words and, yeah, what may bring it about. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, <clears throat> um, yeah, I totally love uh, John's analogy there of, of free. Um, I always look at like ventral as uh, just social. It's just, again, you feel comfortable in your own body. You're happy to be seen. You're happy to talk to other people and take up space um sympathetic i usually try and relate these more to again mental health terminology just because again what i tend to be what i work with the most so again sympathetic for me is anxious it's anxiety it's the panic it's the it's the again the, the cliche of fight or flight it's the energy root like john just said the arms you know you want to move it's the cortisol being released it's you know the body's preparing for action whether it be to fight or whether it be to run but more often than not you're not actually in a a state which requires that action that's just what's being you know released in the body and it's a very uncomfortable thing you're like you feel really tense and that you need to move but you might be in the car you might be you know at work and there's actually no real threat there's no saber-toothed tiger that's just walked in the office but there's something going on in the body which is telling you i'm not safe right now and then dorsal is your is your very um generic depression it's the you know the, the old stories of people not being able to get out of bed it's the shutdown it's the fetal position it's you know the the unsafe it's the giving up um but then i think as well like i a lot of work that i do with people involves blended states it's well what happens when dorsal is holding hands with ventral well that's now catharsis that's now like spooning or cuddling a loved one it's like you are still and immobile but you are safe and then you've, you've got 
you know, sympathetic and ventral holding hands. You've now got play. You've got that energy, that that mobility, but it's also safe and social. So again, there's a lot of interesting ways that the the polyvagal states can mesh with each other. Ven- uh, sympathetic and dorsal is not a great mix. Then you've got more like bipolar. You've got the you know the the shutdown, but also the energy and you know the hyper alertness, and then the you know so it's there's that's how I sort of try and talk about polyvagal states and, and what how I interact with them and how I see them in other people. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. And it's 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 such an easy language, but you can also make it even easier with what you guys are saying, which is really awesome. And it, it, I'm so glad that you said that because at the end of the day, all of these states are vital. If we were just animals or whatever, or we were cavemen, cave women, and whatever, we didn't have the resources that we have now, we would need all these things. It's totally normal and natural and great to have all these states. If these states weren't on... What's kept us alive for so yeah. long, right? That's why we're all here now. Yeah. If these states weren't online and available, available for you in a split second, then you are going to be in a world of trouble because you would just step out in front of a of a bus and not realize that oh my front flight's kicked in i better you know if you don't have the cognitive reasoning in that moment your body needs to be like mate there's there's a bus coming so you need if you're distracted so it's kind of is that so it's important to know that all of this is good you know and we know that depression anxiety is a big part of this and it sucks and it's crap and i've been there and it's terrible but my body needs to have those things i need them but it's how can i best serve me internally externally to move forward and i love the fact you talk about blending because play is just the best right you so i i like to think about it in racket sport terms so it's the ultimate is you're playing with your mates they're really good friends of yours there's full trust between you if you're very safe with that person you've you're both competitive but you're not too much but you have an amazing game you're having a great time you've got lots of adrenaline cortisol so you can play your game so you're using lots of sympathetic energy you feel super safe it's the ultimate and you feel so revitalized afterwards to have that blend in your system but i don't know where i read it it might have been in one of the books but i love this is such a prime example. So you're playing tennis, you're having a great time. One of you hits the ball too hard and hits the other one in the face. You are probably going to remove yourself from safe and social in that moment, be in a lot of pain <laughs> and start swearing at your mate. And for a split second, you switch to anger and it's full fight and flight, no safe and social. So in an instant, you can drop down the polyvagal ladder. So they talk about the ladder. You work way down the ladder, safe and social, fight and flight, shut down. And then you can work your way back up and I learned recently, which I thought was interesting, that it's quite difficult to go from shutdown to safe and social without fight and flight on the way, which I thought, yeah. So I was intrigued by that. You know, if, you, if you're if having major depression problems, it might be more difficult to, you have to go through a bit of anxiety and mobility movement in your therapy before you can get to to a safe space. And I thought that was interesting because that was my story. Depression for years, I started to process terrible anxiety for a bit while i processed once i processed boom safe and social so it kind of followed that theme but the tennis thing is a prime example for you it's a funny thing which i, I want to bring up on if that's okay so like i we look at coronavirus i know we mentioned it briefly at the beginning i think we're going to see that right now over the next few months like everybody's you know and, and let's take polyvagal to a global setting right now everyone has effectively been shut down on a on a on a mass scale ignore the human body everybody on a, on a on a grand scale has been told to immobile stay at home sheltering's put in place whatever it may be and then to get back to ventral to get back to normal we're now going to have to go through this weird anxious time of well is it okay to go back outside you know what if i get coronavirus and now we're going to see more agoraphobia more ocd sort of behaviors because now people are going to be like you know you already see it here i've i've been in the supermarkets and been heard people to get away get two meters away you know people are already anxious they're already in fight or flight and it's gonna you know we can't just go from immobile to okay back to normal guys everything's fine we're gonna have that transition period i think it's a beautiful way of highlighting that fact we have to go up the ladder there's going to be that adjustment period of you know testing the waters is it safe not really sure we're being told we can go back outside but what if you know her over there's got coronavirus and she sneezes in my eyeballs you know it's, you have all these weird feelings right these all these weird thoughts but then eventually we disconfirm that and we feel oh, okay no nobody's died i'm back i'm okay we're back back safe we get back to ventral but it's going to take time 
That's a really nice example, actually, with COVID. And we will bring it up a few times as we do this, but that's really good. I'm aware that I get so excited. I've, I, I don't want to keep talking too much. So let's crack on with the next question. And I'll bring all my points in at the end, probably. Um, so now we're looking. I hope that makes sense to everybody at home. They're the different states. There is more to it. We'll talk about bagel break later on, too, how easy it is for us to drop down the ladder. But now we're looking at what... Honestly, guys, this blew my mind. When I learned about co-regulation, self-regulation and neuroception, holy shit, neuroception was like, it took my massage business to the next level as soon as I learned about neuroception. The fact that I knew that my nervous system would have a dance with another nervous system when we meet for the first time. Your nervous systems make a decision about your relationship with that person in a split second before your brain can even kick in. And then your thoughts start kicking in. Why are they being so rude? Where's their eye contact? Blah, blah, blah. All your stories start kicking in. But that dancing is how I like to describe it of neuroception is huge. And then co-regulation is obviously, you know, feeling safe with each other and regulating each other's nervous systems. So if I head over to you, John, about this, especially from a coaching perspective, I guess co-regulation and neuroception must be huge for you. Absolutely. Um, I, I believe it's just so important for people to have safe spaces to be able to to process whatever they're going in life, to be able to uh, to be able to navigate through life, and that's really uh, what I, I desire to do. Um, I, when I think about core regulation, um, I, I always <laughs> I used to wonder why, whenever I was going through a stressful events, I would always head to my phone, pick up, and call a good friend. And there was something about their voice that I didn't have to tell them about my problem, but it seemed like just hearing another voice and a voice of someone that I love would soothe me. And uh, now knowing about polyvagal theory, I can realize that I was looking to co-regulate by being in the presence of someone that felt safe. Uh, my first, one of my first experiences, well, one of my first memories that I ever have, and, and it always uh, amazes me that I have this memory. Uh, it's the earliest and most precious memory that I have. It's of my grandfather. He was a preacher. Uh, I, I remember him holding me. I remember being in his arms. I remember hearing his voice. I remember hearing him praying for me. Uh, I remember uh, being in the living room. I remember him uh, taking out olive oil and he placed it on my forehead. That's the way that he would uh, pray for me. And um, I can see his eyes. I can see his smile as I, I, I think about that. Um, and um, I, feel, I felt loved and safe in that moment. And whenever he's done praying for me, he places me in a baby swing. I ask my mom, like, how old was I? Because I remember myself being placed in a baby swing. And she tells me that I must have been around three months old. And uh, I was suffering from colic. And my grandfather, she called my grandfather who lived an hour away to come and pray for me. But for me, that is the perfect picture of my need for love and safety in co-regulation with others. That got ruptured from my life at the age of four. But within me, there's an innate need and desire to have someone to co-regulate with because as humans, we're created for connection. And, uh, and so, yeah, neuroception, let, it, right away, it tells me whenever somebody is, is, is safe to be with or it's my body's interpretation of whether someone who has come into my presence is going to be a safe person for me to interact with. And um, I shamelessly use it. That's my body's defense mechanism. Yeah, you're spot on. And, what, and kind of with the co-regulation side is understanding who is a good co-regulator, being aware of who may be a slightly more triggering. But parenting, if all parents understood co-regulation in, in detail, I think there'd be a totally different, you know, set of kids coming out through the new generation because I've been able to apply a lot of co-regulation to my stepson. And it's really changed things for me um, because I realized when I looked at my life, I was like, who's in my life? I feel like I was always on this battle to stay safe because I didn't have nervous systems around me. They were all so dysregulated that I was being the regulated one and I was exhausted. So I had to find other nervous systems that can build, you know, boost me up and make me feel safe too. And it's such a big part of that. And just before I go to you, Dale, I just wanted to say like the neuroception bit that once you understand how a nervous system looks in a different state and then you go outside and you stop people watching, you're like, whoa look at their nervous system because you can tell from their body language their posture 
eye contact, facial muscle usage, and you know, especially around the lip area, wrinkles in the face. If they're completely vacant and they're not using facial muscles, there's a chance that they are not in safe and social. They are down the ladder, and that's not online, basically. So it allows you to go out into the world and be a lot more compassionate as you're walking around town. And if so, you say hello to someone, morning, and they just completely blank you. You're not like prick. You're like, you're like, you're, you, you say to yourself, oh God, you know, I, I hope they're all right. I wonder what they're going through, whatever. And it allows you to see the world in a much more compassionate lens. And it's really, really beautiful. And it's allowed, like I said, it's allowed me to make my massage clients safe within the first five minutes they walk in the room. How can I make them feel safe? I can tell they're not. And I found little clever little ways to interact with them, to make them really connect to me deeply and know that I've got their, literally got their back for the massage. <laughs> But um, I just want to say that because honestly, my my I just my massages were so much more effective by doing that because they were completely safe with me and they let it go. They let their body go and let me do my work. And it completely changed everything. So I wanted to share that with you. So, Dave, you co-regulation, your reception. What, what's uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, the way that I look at neuroception is um, it's almost detection without awareness. Um, and it's like when you bring an awareness to it it becomes powerful um it's like i i always say like your neuroception is like the watchtower on top of your head like the, the guy who's just keeping an eye out for everything that you don't see obviously some people may call it a subconscious whatever it is you know um and and yeah i think you know your body is basically a threat detection machine that's how humans have survived for so many years we've learned to detect threats and keep ourselves safe um and you know the majority of it goes on without us even being aware of it and i do think again we try and bring this into with what's going on in the world right now with black lives matter and stuff like that there's a lot of people's neuroception being triggered by you know race and things like that and it's it may not necessarily be anything that's happened to them it's the stories that they've been told or the story they've been told growing up or the things they've read about in history books so if they see, you know, a group of black people walking towards them, they immediately are much more alert than if it was a group of white people. And that in, for some people, that is their neuroception, which then causes the behaviors which, you know, are undesirable in this in this world that we live in. Um, when we then talk about co-regulation, like co-regulation is almost a biological imperative you think about the first thing that happens when you were born you are placed skin to skin with your mother you know you have that connection you are told from a very young age that you are safe you are regulating your body with someone else and again like a lot of the trauma that i see in people is when at a young age that co-regulation has been taken away it's been made to feel uh shameful or again abandonment comes in uh, and John's absolutely right. Like co-regulation is we're social creatures. Humans are social creatures and we need to be able to co-regulate in safety with other humans. And until we are able to co-regulate, we cannot self-regulate, you know, because if your brain is telling you the same story over and over again, and that's the only story that you're hearing and it's wrong, how are you then able to think differently or to tell yourself a different story you need someone else's perspective in safety that you are then going to trust and believe in order to help you through whatever it is that you're going through um so yeah co-regulation neuroception they, they are almost like the the fundamental building blocks of, of polyvagal yeah thank you and we talk a lot about you know the importance of safety it's all over manco's content you know safety is everything it's uh it's really important when I go into those those school systems because they've kind of proved, like you said about the prefrontal cortex earlier, Dave, about how it's very hard for you to learn and to take things on board and to concentrate if you're not unsafe and social. If you're fight and flight or shut down, you, you're disconnected, you are distracted. So to expect children to learn in environments that are scary or they don't feel held or maybe they've got troubles at home maybe school's the only safe place which obviously is in some way a, a blessing but i know when i go into these schools that's the first thing i'm going to look for how safe are all my all my children and how can i make sure that that's the case because then they've got a chance of personal development and learning and adapting to being able to interact with other people and i just think that's so so important and like you said you can't really know how to self-regulate without co-regulation and it can cause lots of problems as adults can't it when you don't know how to co-regulate in relationships 
misreading everything because you haven't had a sense of what what version of love is. And as you guys know, yesterday I put a post out from Bruce Perry all about this misconception of, you know, self-love and, you know, being loved is a prime example of this, I guess, for Coreg, which is like they say, oh, man, you've got to learn to love yourself 100 percent. Go away for a couple of months on your own in a cave or something. Learn to love yourself. Figure out what you want. Come back. And then you'll be lovable and uh, you can love other people. It's like, hang on a minute. I do need some people to kind of show me the way and build a community and a tribe around me that sees me, hears me, understands me, wants to be around me, sees my value. You know, it's very important. Of course, we do need self-love and self-regulation tools. But that post went crazy, shared everywhere. Everyone was commenting because we all know this misconceptions out there in the general social media feel of, hey, guys, you know, love yourself. Boom, done. You know, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. But there's it's the same when people say to me like, uh, oh, depression, just cheer up. It's like. Genius. Or I didn't I think of that. Yeah, it's so like it's just, and that example, it's easier said than done. Right? And that example <laughs> of that, like shutdown, you go to someone who's in shutdown. Man, get out of shutdown. What are you doing? Crack on, get into safe and social. Off you go. It's like in that moment, they need to either do something, be around somebody or have something that pulls them out. It can't just be. All right, cool. Nice. But all that does is bring about shame, for shame for them feeling the way that they're feeling. And then that just makes it even harder for them to climb out of it. So, you know, there's, there's nothing to be gained from those silly comments. Yeah. So, John, for you, because I know like well, I know both of you work around mindset and I love the work that you do. So that the, the mindset side of what you do in, in this in this this sort of arena does that mindset allow to keep on board some of these states those mindsets can help those states stay in place so once you're in safe and social using certain mindset regulation tools to kind of keep you keep you up i guess am i getting that wrong or is that right yeah i i, <laughs> I see what the some of the biggest challenges that i see people coming in with is uh, the mindset, the attitude that they have towards their life experience is one of self-judgment. So you find people feeling bad for feeling, for feeling bad, for feeling sad. Uh, they, they judge their emotions. They categorize them, some as being good and some as being bad. And uh, what, you know, my practice does is it, it provides a space for them to release judgment and to begin to develop the mindset, the attitude that feelings just are. And there's not a need to uh, try to outperform someone. Um, you, you had mentioned something about about like pulling whenever someone's in dorsal, like you know, just snap out of it. Uh, and there's a lot of times that people are hearing narratives of others who say like, well, what you went through wasn't as bad as what I went through or what my neighbor went through. And it becomes this trauma comparison that people get trapped in, and they feel unworthy for feeling the way that they feel. And what I what I have seen polyvagal theory do and, and the way that I have implemented it is it gives people freedom just to feel whatever they need to feel at any given moment and not have experienced judgment over it. It's breaking that mindset of their feeling is wrong. I love that. Thank you. I just wanted to yeah confirm that. I, I, can, I can see that now that you can kind of your experience of what's going on for you can create lots of different kinds of thoughts and stuff. So that, that, that kind of mindset awareness can allow you to show some more compassion, more compassionate language towards your state that you're in, um, which, you know, when you have that amazing combination of top down, bottom up integration, you can really start to move forward. And just quickly before we move on to the next question, especially with co-regulation, the therapeutic relationship when safe is where well, where I believe where transformation takes place, a therapeutic relationship that's safe, a therapeutic, therapeutic relationship that isn't safe, obviously isn't going to work really that well. So it's it. That's another part of co-regulation that when you go and choose a therapy, don't necessarily get really obsessed about the therapy and more about the people that you're looking up. Oh, wow. The testimonials are great. I love them in their video. They seem to kind of I relate to them a little bit, kind of get a good sense of who you want to hold a space for you not the therapy or even the room that you're in more so the persons you walk in i've had some interesting experiences with practitioners that didn't make me feel safe not because they were bad i just wasn't the right client for them i was just we were just different and that really was really useful to know at the time anyway uh we've got so many questions left let's have a part two guys um 
And I've just snuck two questions in when no one was looking uh, that I realized I forgot. So um, anyway, we're doing really well. Let's keep going. So we're looking at story follows state, which for some bizarre reason I didn't include in here. So uh, if I go to you, Dave, on kind of what is the, 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 the theory and logic between story following our state? Story following our state. That's, a, that's an, always an interesting uh, concept because it, it, again, we're talking about an awareness, an awareness to what is the story that we are telling ourselves. And again, I deal with people who you know have battled depression, and the story that they tell themselves is, "I'm not good enough. I'm a burden. Uh, people will be better off without me." Blah blah. And and that story is just so dorsal. It's just like, I want to be invisible. Nobody, I'm not worthy. Uh, I just want to be locked away in a room, in a, in, my, in a cave. And this sort of comes back to co-regulation. Because again, if that if you are that person, I, again, talking from personal experience, this was what I can relate to, is that these were the stories that was going around in my head. And, you know, a, a large part of this almost relates as well to what John was just saying about comparison is because, you know, I had... The apartment in city center had the car, the decent online job, you know, making money, freedom to travel. And I would walk down the walk out the building and see a homeless person. And he'd be happier than I was. And I would feel so much shame. I'm like, what have I got to be upset about? What have I got to be so depressed about when I've got all these things? And then that just made it worse. Then I, could, then I felt guilty. I, was like, I felt more shameful. So again, the story was, you know, there's definitely something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm bringing nothing of value to this world. Um, and yeah, nobody likes me. I'm better off on my own. And like I said the state just is dorsal. That's just where, where it leads to. And I think it's that's where co regulation comes in because, and that is very hard when you are dorsal because it's the exact opposite from social and safe. It's like, how do you build safety with someone when you don't feel worthy? Um, and that really is the biggest battle. It's not impossible. And that, again, totally agree with what, what you were just saying as well, Owen. Like, it doesn't matter whether it's CBT, EMDR, EFT, you know, pull out all the letters you want for whatever modality. Unless there is safety, it's not going to work. And, you know, I think as well with, with a lot of things that come around that, you know, the story in the state is if you are not feeling safe to tell your story, you're not going to change the state. Yeah, and that taps into your you know, your love of vulnerability too, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Which is a hard one for a lot of men. But yeah, is is just, you know, feeling, again, but it all comes from safety. You need to feel, in order, you know, I'm not saying, oh, just go and tell every single person your deepest, darkest thoughts and secrets and be vulnerable. You need to have that safety there. You need to have that co-regulation. And, and that's... Like I said, I totally agree. Like it's the most important thing for for a coach, for a therapist, for a counselor, for anybody, for for a friend, for families, uh, for parents, for children. It's like safety is is the key. Um, and without that, uh, very limited healing work can really can really happen. Yeah, thank you. I think I think sometimes our stories then turn out into beliefs over time, don't they? If they go on long enough, you start to believe it. And I, I, you know, after all these years of going through my, you know, parts of my healing journey, and I used to be stuck in stories, but at the time, I just believed the stories because I was just depressed constantly. So I was self, you know, self defeating, and there's lots of self hatred. So I'm not worthy. I'm fat. Blah 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 blah. Can't get a girlfriend. Blah blah blah. Start to believe that I'm unlovable, and then it just gets out of hand. And then you are very stuck. And I can see people now in and around my life and I can see how stuck they are in their stories. I'm like, I just really want to help them. I say to them, look, try, try, rather than saying maybe think more positive, I'm like, try not to get hooked into your stories. Just see well, I mean, they are. Yeah. That. I was going to say, the way that I, I sort of see it with a lot of people is there's an incident or a trauma somewhere which leads to an emotion that you, which lead, obviously that thing makes you feel a certain way which then leads to the story, which leads to the belief, which then leads to a behavior. And it's, again, acknowledging those stepping stones and, again, getting back to the story, getting back to the behavior and the belief that can then change the behavior, change the story, change the emotion attributed to that event and realize it doesn't hold power on you anymore. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's where a lot of the real deep work comes from.
Yeah, totally, totally. So, John, for you, with story follows state, what, what we've, I know we just said a lot, but what, what, what can you add? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm right there with you guys. Uh, for me, um, I, I well, right away when you, I heard you ask this question to Dave, I, I related it to myself and the way that I have experienced this. And uh, I mentioned that at the age of four, you know, um, that safety was ruptured and I experienced trauma. And uh, whenever you experience trauma, your, your mind right away tries to make meaning of what happened. And perhaps even if you know, you don't even realize that it was supposed to be a traumatic experience till a few years later or adulthood, uh, your body is always going to be on, on guard. And um, some of the stories that, that would accompany my experience was, was John, you're weak. Uh, one of the things that uh, I experienced uh, early in life is that uh, I stopped fighting for myself. And so I allowed myself to experience more abuse whenever, uh, in retrospect, I know that I had the strength to overcome, but I was so dorsal that I created the story that I was weak. I wasn't worth fighting for. Uh, I, um, I would never win. I would never be loved. I would never be protected and it wasn't worth the fight. So learning to over, understanding that it was my state of dorsal, my, my state of trying to prepare myself and save energy for an impending death was really what was guiding that story that I was, that I was creating allows me to release the story because my body was just protecting itself. And so I'm working on creating healthier narratives. So that way, if I am ever pressured into a place where I don't feel safe, I don't go into that story of um, John, you're weak again. Because reality is, I'm not weak. I'm I'm am I'm an empowered male. I'm strong. There's there's not a need for me to hold on to a belief that is going to hold me in a dorsal state. Yeah, super powerful. And you know these these kind of states and your vagal break, the strength, it's all shaped as, as a child too. And obviously, like we know with neuroplasticity with the mind being able to be shaped and changed and the brain and stuff, same with the nervous system too. You know, we're, I think many of us aren't doomed at all to whatever's happened to us right now. There is there is hope, there is there is a chance. But it's just having, again, the right people, isn't it, that, that, can, to, can, that can get you there. And for me, sorry for the state is I like to think about it, you know, when you meditate, um, and you lie there or sit there or whatever, your thoughts start flying in. And we're told, obviously, don't attach your thoughts. Let them come in. Let them flow out. It's not permanent. It'll come through. Then another thought will come through. Another thought. You're processing. You're processing. But if your state isn't quite right and you have an anx you've got anxiety as you start to meditate, your thoughts are probably going to be a little bit more darker. So it's being aware that that will shift and change and maybe a bit more dread-like if you're in shutdown. So I learned that from my mindfulness practice that I noticed that my thoughts over a year or two when I meditated at the beginning, they just start to shift and change. They become more ho hopeful stories. They become more positive stories. Not that I can control my thoughts necessarily, but I was able to kind of create a new, I don't even know what the word is. It just, it did kind of change through daily practice. and, and Almost like a reframing, I guess. Yeah, I guess it would be, yeah, up there with a the reframing thing. And I just, once I realized about story follows state, that when I'm down, down the ladder, and I have this with a few friends, and especially my partner. We know when we're down the ladder. One of us is down the ladder, so I'll say, "Ah, oh, babe, I'm down the ladder." <laughs> and then I know to just go away and just do a quick meditation because there's no point trying to get myself out of fight and flight when I'm in it. I just need to respect that I'm in it. So rather than carrying on working or carrying on doing the housework, I'm stressed out. Just go and chill out, mate. Get yourself back up the ladder a little bit. Um, and I can make light of that and make it fun too. I mean, how cool is that? And that type. I think the fact that you have that awareness is is amazing. That communication, that safety with your partner, like that's gold dust right there. That's yeah, communication perfect. in that respect, on signing each other is huge. You know, if you check love languages in there in the mix too, then you're having a oh, party. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I, I literally, I'm someone. Want, if people watch this regularly on episode eight, I interviewed this amazing lady called Dawn, who is a relationship expert. We had the most amazing chat about all of this. Um, she was amazing. But anyway, that's a different show. So next up, we've got, I've also snuck this question in when you guys went looking, which is triggers and glimmers. I cannot believe I did not include this, but triggers and glimmers. And before we talk about, you know, the things that trigger us down the ladder and the things that bring us back up, those special moments, 
let's just I'll just quickly mention the vagal break. So the your ability to withhold a level of stress or whatever's going on for you and remain in safe and social, I think is a true sign of how resilient we are. How much can we take on and stay safe for those around us? So I know within a school setting, when I go into it, I need to have a very strong vagal break. It's my duty as a, you know, as someone looking after children to have a nice strong vagal break. So if they get triggered, they don't trigger me. That is my mission now going forward. And I can't wait to, to increase that through time. So that that's what that is, is your ability to drop down a ladder. And years ago, mine was, I can, I can reflect now and know it was absolutely appalling vagal break. So I would literally like, if the room wasn't quite right and I was like, oh God, I, I dropped something and I get really angry. I shouldn't be get angry about gravity. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I did. I used to drop stuff and get really angry. And you know, they say people, oh, he's always had a bad temper. And now I say, no, he's just got a dodgy vagal break that just needs a bit of work. That's how I like to see it now. It's again, empowering, isn't it? So um, I can't remember who did the last question. So I'll go back over to, 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 to you, Dave, on this one. So with triggers and glimmers, you know, how important is it with mindful awareness to start to pick up on this and start to see what's really going on? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really, really important. Um, you know, if we're, for anyone listening who's not, not aware, you know, we're, we're talking like triggers of things which are going to sort of dysregulate you, maybe like send you down the ladder. And, and glimmers are going to be those things which can help you get back up the ladder and those things which, you know, bring you more hope um, or, 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 you know, reconnect some something positive or good inside of you. Um, for a lot of people that, that I work with, they're, again, it all comes to awareness. Like they're not aware of their trigger or, again, if their environment is a trigger and they feel trapped and unable to do anything about it, like they're really in a bit of a tough situation. And once you are aware of like what's potentially triggering you, you begin to bring an awareness to it and ask, well, why? Why does that trigger me? Because a lot of times you'll say, or I hear people say like, oh, you know, my next door neighbor really triggers me. Why? Oh, because he cuts his lawn at like seven o'clock in the morning and the kids are still asleep and then blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, can you control your neighbor? Does he have every right to cut his lawn at that time? You know, it's, it's like... The things that trigger you a lot of the time are outside of your control, but you take it on as like this big thing, which is which is happening in your life, which is you're choosing to allow to send you down the ladder or to, to send you sympathetic largely. Um, and and glimmers are the exact, you know, the opposite things. It's like for, it's amazing. Like I know people who their glimmers are hugely related to smells. Like memories of smells or you know things that smell like like home to them or like again freshly cut grass that's nothing to do with the neighbor cutting his lawn analogy but you know or home you know freshly baked bread things like it reminds them of safety it reminds them of being at home with mom when she, when she was a child and that that smell of freshly baked bread can bring them back to that feeling of safety and when you are aware of those things which can you know not send you right back up and down the ladder but can help you and to bring you back to a grounded place or an awareness a present place of what's going on right now am i safe is everything okay mm, freshly baked bread you know <laughs> it may sound a bit weird to anyone listening to this but it's just being aware of whatever it is which feels safe to you and using that and being aware of those things which trigger unsafety or disconnection to you and how can we limit those um that, that's how i tend to approach uh yeah triggers and glimmers yeah thank you i think it brings like another language to add into mindful awareness too because you you have all the mindful awareness there too and you throw this in the mix and like, i i think about for anybody listening for a glimmer the prime example is you know like someone is like really like there's been a loss in the family or something just say they're really really down and they've been crying and you've got arm around the shoulder and then you crack a joke or you talk about do you remember that time and they do a little smile so in that moment they just smile they give you a bit of eye contact but then they go straight back to obviously being really upset but in that moment they had a little bit of safe and social you could see it. it it gave them a bit of relief and it's such i see it in films all the time it's such a beautiful example of a glimmer even if it's for a few seconds and i know that with anger too i think for me if i get a little bit down a bit aggressive comedy every single time will help me if someone cracks a joke or whatever I cannot resist comedy. It will just bring me straight back up and my anger 
start to dis dissipate and go away. So, it, and I think the good thing about comedy is it's quite visceral, isn't it? You you laugh, you move your body, don't you? When you when you when you're in that state, so I think there's a maybe a sympathetic release there too. I think for anybody that's going through like depression, anxiety, spotting those I know five minutes worth of glimmers throughout your day is a good place to start. There must have been somewhere today where you had maybe that you you've got a dog that's your life. There's a glimmer right there. You may not have human connection right now, but you've got this amazing dog. So surround yourself in that love and hopefully be able to use that a little bit for connection. It's just looking outside the box where you're not getting stuck. So for you, John, again, we've not left you much, but uh, with your clients and stuff, do you do stuff to do around, you know, triggers and things that set them off? You know, one, this is a topic where I believe that like emotional intelligence and polyvagal theory are just like they mesh together so uh, so perfectly, um, you know, part of uh, having emotional intelligence is having self-awareness. Whenever you have self-awareness, then you're able to have self-management. When you have self-awareness, then you're able to have social awareness. And from social awareness, you're able to have relationship management. But it all starts with being aware. And uh, really what uh, I, I like doing is I, I like asking um, questions you know, powerful questions that help my clients be able to identify what is serving them and what no longer serves or what has been holding them back, causing them to shrink back from the place that they desire to be in life. Um, a lot of that is just identifying, you know, the thoughts that come to mind, the actions that they surround themselves with, the environment that they're in, and uh, really help them identify what is needed to help them move forward to where they want to be in life. And it can be something simple. Like you, you talked about, um, about watching comedies, having a place of laughter in life is very important for people. And I see a lot of people that I work with that are stuck in, in dorsal states that need that in their life. And so they make commitments to surround themselves with people or with other activities that are gonna instill that sort of joy. One of the biggest things that I, I see people do and I encourage my clients to do is to create playlists of music that will help them move from one state to another. Uh, that music is something that I, I relate to, so it's very easy for me to communicate the language of music. Um, but yeah, there's there's uh, those activities creating and listening to whatever message or means or voices uh, that can help raise your level is something that's of, I believe, about most important, having something that is safe to listen to and to connect with. That's amazing. I'm, I'm glad you, there's a bit of play you mentioned in there and obviously how important, um, you know, if I could do any job, I think they would, it'd probably be a play therapist. I just think it'd be absolutely brilliant to allow children to process their trauma through play. It's so powerful, honestly, just, I've seen some of the videos on it. It just looks absolutely beautiful for people, um, which is amazing. Um, so triggers and glimmers for me, I think I probably said everything I need to say on that one. Uh, but I do I have to say, like the coach and I've had uh, with my amazing coach, Steve, is what I love is when we try to like search for, for a trigger, I had to sometimes get through my layers of my layers of stories. So you think it's this. Or maybe it's this. Maybe I do this behave because of this. And you get so stuck and lost in. But what is it, though? And then when we do the like the why game. So why? And then I really think about it. No, it's not that. Why? Why? You get deeper, deeper, deeper. And then say, I get to the bottom and go, oh, it's people pleasing, but there's still more why, but why are you people pleasing? Now I go back, oh, I keep getting triggered by say my mum who never, you know, never saw that I'd been successful. And I keep trying to prove to her that I am. And that's an ongoing constant trigger every time they make a comment. So you start to start to unravel, you know, these little incidences that you don't see when you get so stuck in what you think it is. I'm just doing this because I need to. There's a lot of need, isn't there, in society? I need to do this. I need to do this to feel better. I need to go out and do this because I'm told that's what I need to do. But if it doesn't align, then that's just silly. And I know, for example, that the gaming industry gets a lot of bad rap for being, you know, you should just stay indoors and just be playing games online with your mates, whatever. But they miss the point of the mates bit. Yeah. <laughs> if, their, if their community and safe and social impact is coming from interacting with friends online, I think that's amazing. And they should definitely keep that. You know, as long as they're able to pay their bills and eat, they just leave them to it. There's so much judgment, isn't there, around other people's behavior, even if it makes them feel safe. 
don't judge people if they found safety. As long as it's not harming anybody, obviously, it's absolutely fine. But there's so much judgment of what we should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and it just, yeah, it just gets me a little bit. And I go down a ladder about that. So there you go. Um, so let's just touch on, I'm going to skip the safe and social question. We'll just do that at the end. Um, I just want to touch on trauma because at the end of the day, that is the point of the podcast. So quite useful. So we're looking at how we feel trauma impacts, you know, what kind of trauma can do to our state kind of in the moment. But I'm going to go over to you, Dave, just see what your thoughts are on the long term effect on a state. And, you know, they talk about trauma being something that we 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 take the response with us in our body, not necessarily the event, but the response, which obviously will affect your state. So do you think there's a long term state impact from carrying a trauma with us? Um, I, certainly. Um, again, I think it's Bessel who says, you know, the issues are in the tissues, right? And, you know, the trauma affects us on a, <clears throat> on a, on a sort of a whole body level, uh, emotion again, stored in the body. Um, it's, yeah, it, it absolutely does. Like if you look at, you know, I, I've, I work, again, I don't want to confidentiality give too much away. Um, but there's a, someone that I work with who's had some very severe trauma from a child and we're talking multiple instances of sexual abuse and um, rape through teenage years and then physical abuse and to her you know everything is almost unsafe and the people who were supposed to be safe for her were not safe and you know again this leads a little bit more into sort of attachment styles but she had what I would class as a very disorganized attachment style. Like she craved the attention of um, parental figures, but then when they got close, wanted them to go away because she didn't feel safe. And that was very much a sympathetic state that she found herself in. Like she didn't know what was safe. She didn't know what safe should feel like. And whenever, even if someone who was potentially safe would try and get close, she'd push them away through fear that they would hurt her in some way or invade her privacy in some way. So these things which happened to her when she was six, eight, 12, 13 years old are now still with her when she's 19, 20. And her go-to state is to be sympathetic because she doesn't know what safety she feels like. She doesn't know how to have that secure attachment. And it's taken a lot of, you know, very gentle work because this is some very sacred stuff that we're going through um, to sort of reframe and, and again, to take away the shame that, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about this is what I'm worth. This is all that I'm worth. This is, you know, no one, I don't deserve love. I'm only, you know, to be used as a as a thing for, for pleasure for other people. Or, you know, if I act the wrong way, I deserve to get beaten. And again, this comes back to the stories and the states. It's, so it's all connected in this very intricate web. But yeah, trauma will keep people in a state. And don't get me wrong, obviously we navigate those states, but we ideally want our default state to be ventral. We want to be safe and social. But trauma can lead our default state to be one of sympathetic or dorsal, dependent on what's happened to us. And the only true way to get through that and to get us back to a default state of ventral is to really do that trauma work and to go back and process like, well, what happened? Why did it happen? Uh, and and basically, you know, a lot, a lot of thing with childhood stuff is it wasn't their fault. The people who were supposed to be keeping them safe did not keep them safe. And that's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're unworthy. It's because more than likely the people who were safe to, or should have been safe to them were also traumatized as child as children and don't know how to look after and protect children so it's a very intense and very deep conversation hopefully nobody's listening to this is getting triggered right now um but yeah it's one to be aware of like yeah your trauma will definitely have a part to play on the states that you're in most of the time yeah, thank you. That's really, really powerful. And that, that story kind of shows that. And it's kind of like we talk about nervous, a nervous system situation. We're talk, all talking about dysregulated nervous systems at the end of the day. And if you're repeatedly, re repeatedly getting that dysregulated nervous system, it starts to, I'm sure, really impact us. And like Basil talks about with the body keeps the score. What I couldn't understand for years is why cognitively I understood that I shouldn't 
do this or I shouldn't feel this way or that's weird, but I know I'm fine. Your body, though, is like, you're not, mate, because you haven't taught me, you haven't actually shown me that you're safe. So I'm just presuming you're not because you haven't been safe for a very long time. So your body can't necessarily listen. It needs, like you said, it needs to be processed with people and safe spaces so we can move forward. And I think about, um, I think one of you, was it John that mentioned ruptures? The repair and rupture terminology I love, especially when you're a parent. So if there's been a rupture in that moment because you wouldn't give them a snack. Uh, so I said snack as if I was a child. So that's how he says it. <laughs> he says he snack. Um, if I don't give the child a snack and they have a tantrum about it, there has been a slight rupture there. So all I need to make sure I do is that I repair that rupture afterwards. Let the fight and flight system play out. Don't try and squash it. If you try and squash their fight and flight, it will get stuck. You need to let them get it out. And then a bit later, when you're both safe and social, we sit down. So we don't want to talk about what happened earlier. Then you have a conversation about it. They open up and they said, I know, but, you know, this, this and this. And you go, oh, I understand that. And you start to repair the rupture. You have a big old hug. All that awesome hormones come out and you're done. But so many ruptures do not get repaired, especially in workplaces, you know, where you can't repair these ruptures. And you have these constant ruptures all the time. Your nervous system just cannot cope over time. And safe and social seems accessible to you at that point. Um, so there's just another example of uh, repair and rupture, which I really like the terminology. So um, I know, John, for you and me, we don't massively work with trauma, but what, what are your thoughts on, you know, the long-term damage of certain incidents, especially because I know you've been through quite a lot too. So your nervous system must have been massively yeah. affected. Yeah. So with everything that's going on right now on the, on, you know, regarding the, the racial tension that's taking place in the United States, uh, I've just really been focused on, on seeing how uh, intergenerational trauma has affected those around me. And uh, there's a lot of people that are hurting and a lot of people that are responding in different ways. And it's been, it's been heartbreaking to watch because I've had my own experience dealing with racism, uh, being uh, being of a Mexican descent and living here in the United States, there's a lot of times that, that I would face or I'd hear uh, derogatory racist remarks being made to me. And uh, something came up recently, a, a memory, because I, 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 I've worked through some things in therapy and I didn't realize what it boiled down to. But there was this one uh, guy that used to bully me in high school, and he used to make racist remarks. Uh, he pushed me around. He tripped me. He was a, a a tall white dude that would wear Wranglers and boots, and it's like a Western wear in in the United States. And um, and so he he would do this, and he would uh, do it repeatedly. And uh, fast forward to the future, I'm an adult. This man had a tragic death. He passed away. And for some reason, I, whenever I am in the presence of someone who is white, taller than me, and wearing boots and wranglers, my heart starts racing. My palms start getting sweaty. And this person has done absolutely nothing wrong to me. I absolutely... I love, I have friends from, from all, all, uh, all over the world <laughs> now with the, the platform that I've had through uh, Instagram, but being in the presence of a white male that is taller than me, that is wearing Wranglers and boots, my body has kept the score. My body remembers that tension. My body remembers being picked up and thrown and being called a wetback and a mojado, which is uh, our derogatory statements, racist remarks towards Mexicans. And it's years have passed by. I have to be aware of that and be conscious of it, because if not, I will carry that story into, uh, in, into interacting with any tall white male with Wranglers and boots. So um, it's just where I'm at. It doesn't make me a bad person. It's just my body remembers that trauma. It's exactly what we're saying about neuroception, right? It's your watchtower going, oh, this is dangerous. We don't like this, you know, because it's trying to keep you safe. It's incredible. Uh, what, what really caught my attention, it was actually this past week that I really began to reflect on this. 
Um, I, I saw a comment by this person's mother on social media saying that she did not uh, accept uh, responsibility. She would not apologize for the slavery that took place 500 years ago. And I triggered immediately. And I've always respected this woman res despite her having a son that bullied me whenever I was a child. But whenever she said that, and I realized um, I am still suffering, even though her son is no longer living on this planet. And I'm not making light of his death or trying to be like mean or, or uh, you know, be disrespectful. It's just my reality is that my body has stored that trauma that I experienced as a child. And uh, I know that there's others on this planet who have the embodiment of trauma in their body still, and they're working through it, and it's not easy. I mean, just to add to that as well, John, it sounds like we can almost trace the generational trauma of what, if this was his mother, right? So yes. what was he being exposed to growing up? What was the story he was getting told, which led to his behaviors against you? Doesn't doesn't excuse it, doesn't make it okay, no. but when we can have that little bit of awareness, again, it changes the game. Yes. Yeah, thanks, yes. guys. And such powerful stories there. And it kind of taps into the... I like to think about it as like a jukebox. So like you go through life and all these events happen to you and there's a dangerous, you know, a dangerous thing just happened to you and it's recorded. So that, in, that instance recorded on your CD, CDs, I eh? remember them. So it recorded on a CD <laughs> and it pops into your jukebox. It's there for a rainy day. You know what I mean? And then so it will come up later on. It will trigger that music to play. I like to think about it that way. So you start recording all these incidences as you grow up that are glimmers, triggers, all the kind of stuff that goes along with it. But at some point you need to pop onto that CD give it a play and maybe rewrite some of the uh, instruments in it and change it up a little bit. That's like my little analogy for it as you process through that, that tune. And then that CD eventually can be sold off on eBay. No one's going to buy it, but you can sell it <laughs> off on eBay. And then that track is at your jukebox. And then you, because you could be safe and social all you bloody want. You could go through this journey and you're like, I've made it. I've done it. Safe and social. Then you'll smell something and go straight down the ladder because, you know, something happened to you completely unaware of it. And I always remember just a quick story because I'm aware that uh, this is going on a bit longer than we planned. But there was a lady who was very, very high functioning, but wasn't so it wasn't quite right. And she never got down to it, had counseling. There was always something there. And she didn't know what it was. And then one day she was filling up her car at a petrol station and a guy was filling up his. And all he did was open his mouth and he had a very particular accent. And that accent triggered her into essentially a full on shaking fit. Fell to the floor, started shaking, had a complete, you know, fight and flight response breakdown. And that was the gateway for her to then go and work with this amazing coach that worked with her. And they went back to her being trapped in in a shed at the bottom of the field and being abused and stuff when she was a kid. And but it was that accent. She didn't remember the shed. She didn't remember the abuse. But the accent had kept the straw in that in that jukebox. And she's been able to process that. She couldn't leave the country or do anything really that much. Then she went and traveled the world and she completely changed her life. And all it took was an accent. So we're not saying that you can go through a polyvagal awareness journey, mindfulness journey, boom, you're done. Because there may be the odd trigger here and there. And who likes confrontation, really? If you're safe and social, I don't think you really like confrontation. That's normally something you offer when you're in fight and flight. So... That's a prerequisite of that. So it's a, a kind of another example of, you know, how these these body keeps the score bits. We've probably got at least 50 songs in all of us us free right now. You know, I, I'm sweat I'm sweating like a crazy man in this sound booth right now. And it's put me down a lot a little bit because I feel really uncomfortable. So I'm I, getting more and more shiny as this goes on. <laughs> so I'm like, but the main thing is that I'm with two awesome dudes that make me feel safe. So I can sweat all I want and you bring me back up the ladder. No problem. So there's just a lot. We'll accept you and your sweaty form. Yeah, going, don't you, you worry. So, you know, it's just a prime example of that. Even when you're going through some tough times, if you've got people around you that can hold you, you can get through those tough times. That's kind of the point. And I get that a lot of people don't have people and it's so sad they don't have safe regulators and we're not saying it's because some people don't and it's really really sad but i just hope those people can find somebody somewhere along the way because that's really, really important so let's finish up guys uh because what we're we on now hour 25 wow five minutes let's do it um god this is one out of a question for five minutes but how i think we talked a little about it anyway so how can we use polyvagal awareness within our lives well i think we kind of nailed it but just to round up john if you just want to give us a goodbye kind of thing for us to think about with polyvagal in our life to help yeah i, I think that just 
the greatest thing that it can do for for someone to empower them is really just to give them a space uh, to be able to navigate through their emotions, through life, through uh, whatever physiological state they find themselves in without any type of judgment. It allows you to take a look at at yourself and just uh, and just recognize that you're human. So uh, I um, I strongly suggest to you know to keep this awareness open in your life. I just strongly suggest uh, surrounding yourself with conversation that involves this. If it's new to you, new language, there's a great podcast. We have two great podcasters that we're, we're doing this uh, session with, both Owen and Dave. Uh, there's a Polyvagal podcast. There's the work of Deb Dana, Steve Porges. Educate yourself Make yourself aware of where you lack awareness. I really believe that's where it begins. And start the journey. Partner with someone and start the journey. Yeah, amazing. Uh, for you, Dave, your little bit of insight before we go? Uh, yeah, I'll try and keep it as short and sweet as I can. Um, polyvagal for me, like like John just nailed it, awareness was the, was the key thing for me. I think for anybody who's listening to this and has maybe resonated with anything that we've said or wanted to find out more, it all starts with that curiosity, like do the research, like listen to Owen's content, it's fantastic. Um, again, there's so much stuff out there with Deb Dana, Stephen Porges, uh, other people, and I, I've done an IGTV story about it. Um, you know, just, just it doesn't, it may sound complicated at first, but give it a chance. And when you have the awareness of polyvagal, uh, it, you can apply it not only to yourself, but to other people around you. And then all of a sudden the world makes so much more sense and again the final thing which i say to everybody when it comes to polyvagal is the goal is not to always be ventral the goal is to build flexibility in your nervous system you need to feel sympathetic sometimes you need to feel dorsal sometimes but you also need to know that you can get out of them and again have that flexibility and having the awareness around polyvagal is again i think the fundamental key to allowing that that nervous system flexibility thank you man that's beautiful and yeah i'll just add that you know, it can open up a whole new empowering language for anybody listening. If you, like I said, look into it, dip your toes in, listen to a few podcasts. Like John said, there's a Polyvagal podcast with Justin Sinceri. Absolutely amazing. He does some amazing work over there. And I've actually done a, I think it's about eight or nine minutes, isn't it, guys? I think, uh, um, what is Polyvagal video, which is just like a little, a little, just a little insight for you guys. And I know it's a very, been a very popular video. A lot of people have been sharing it around. So I'll put a link in so you guys can check that out. It, it explains it really, really well. I've got a new guest jumping on the podcast next week uh, from uh, from London. Guys, you're going to love him. He's awesome. And um, he's a happiness coach. What a legend. But he didn't know anything about polyvagal until I told him yesterday. So he went over and watched my video and went, holy shit, man. This is awesome. So that's another recruit. He found the rabbit hole. <laughs> it's a, it's a community. So he's he's loving that. So he'll be on the podcast soon. So I just want to thank you guys so much for everything you obviously do for me anyway. But thank you for this. It's been great. So let me just thank the patrons and I get you guys to do your sign off. So uh, I hope this has been useful to everybody. That brings our episode to a close. I want to thank our patrons for all of their support on Patreon. So a big shout out to Mike Morgan, Emerald McLeod, Maggie Palmer, Roland Chesters, Hannah Irvin, Karen Goodson, Judy Ferris, and of course, Stephen Truelove and Daryl Osborne, who are my co-hosts on our other show. And a huge welcome to our brand new patron who signed up yesterday, Stella Statti, who is an eating disorder specialist, um, works with women. She is an amazing human being. I've known her for years, lives in Glastonbury, and she is awesome. So she signed up to our $7 a month package, so she gets a mention too. And she will also be part of the new coaching cove that will probably be coming at the end of the year, which I'm sure these guys will be involved in once I tell them what it's all about. So you can sign up to Manco Wellbeing's community at the link in the description, www.patreon.com slash MCW. There's a range of other benefits on there. And for more on us, visit mangowellbeing.com. So guys, what's the plan for the future and where can we find you? So uh, John, just in case you need to run away, um, where can we find you online and what's the plan for you, man, for the next year or so? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the.john, J-O-H-N dot Eli. You can also find me on my webpage at www.john-eli.com. And uh, really what I've done is I, I've created a, a program called BD Squared, Be, Do, uh, Be Dream, Believe, Do, uh, just walking through people through really encountering their true identity, their authentic identity, creating a vision for life, the beliefs and the practices that they need in order to have success. And 
I'd love to invite people on the journey. Uh, send me an instant message and I, I answer all my instant messages. So uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Amazing. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, go and check out his Instagram page. It's awesome. I love all your stories too. And I love the music you use on your your hey bro bits they're really cool i'm a big fan of instagram um like using music it reminds me of myspace back in the day we could have a music thing on your profile oh man those are the good times oh, i'm old right so uh for you dave where can we, where's the best place to find you and your podcast uh best place uh, again just like john instagram uh the tag is at the dave furnace all one word um the links to my podcast it's on youtube itunes spotify and google and stitcher and tune and all the usual ones uh all links to that are in my bio um on instagram or again i have a website you can go to just davefurnace.com um that has the podcast links on there and all the show notes it also has ways again more information about uh trauma coaching ways that you can get in touch with me there um yeah that's about it and uh, again just want to say thank you to you guys uh, owen for hosting this and john for for sharing space with us today really enjoyed the chat really enjoyed it guys thank you yeah thank you very much guys uh so thank you everybody for listening at home we'll be next oh hang on it'll be season three how exciting uh, i'll have to get an absolutely epic guest ready to go then maybe it will be my new friend that i met yesterday who is now polyvagal convertent <laughs> so it's all good so thank you very much everybody for all your support honestly instagram's going really quickly for us now i can't can't thank everybody enough for giving me this space because by no means am I an expert but I'm sure learning a lot from all of these people that I'm meeting and holding the space for them I'm hoping is translating so have a wonderful day everybody stay safe um kind of stay home if you can we're still not out of the woods yet and support your friends online thanks so much everybody and we'll check you out for series three thank you bye bye